Some people were asking for them in that little meeting we had yesterday. I talked to, we talked about this two-tiered system of Shankaracharya, where you have two different points of view, which is developed very fully in that uh, Vedanta Sutra commentary that we read. Uh, what is it? Two one fourteen. So there's one level which he calls practical, relative, day-to-day -day level, and then there's the absolute or level in reality. These are Shankaracharya's terms, Vyavahara and Paramartha. Those are actually used, of course we don't have the Sanskrit here, but I managed to find out. It's a two-tiered, two two yeah. Lower and higher knowledge, practical, you know. This is the word he uses. He starts out that 2114. The refutation containing the preceding sutra was set forth on the condition of the practical distinction, that's vyavahara, of enjoyer and objects of enjoying being acknowledged. In reality, however, paramartha, that's what he says, paramartha. In reality, the distinction does not exist because there's no difference of cause and effect. So all throughout this, commentary, you'll see these, this contrast between what is practical and what is real. Does this correlate with the Saguna uh, Brahman? Yeah, this is the Saguna Brahman is in this realm. Nirguna Brahman is in this realm. Uh, I just want to point out that the Buddhists have the same terminology uh, as for the real. Paramartha Satya means truth. The real truth, the highest truth. And then they, their word is samvritti satya for this practical or empirical. Samvritti has the notion of something being uh, concealed or hidden. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody was asking yesterday for these terms, so there they are. I'm not going to examine you on them, but if you ever want to know, there they are. Uh -huh. uh, uh, most of the Buddhist um, scriptures in, in Sanskrit? There's two groups of scriptures. The first group is in, in Pali, which is a Prakrit language, you know, like uh, Pali, P-A-L-I. Pali, the Pali, the earlier scriptures are in Pali, which is a, uh, what's technically called a Prakrit. It's vernacular form of Sanskrit. Out of, out of this Prakrit, you know, you get Bengali, Hindi, all these things like that. Uh, so Pali. And then later, they're in Sanskrit. Uh, is it in the Bihar state? Is it what's spoken there? No, it's not spoken in the Bihar state too. Apparently in Bihar, Buddha's native language may have been something different. Do you mean they began in Pali and then they put them into Sanskrit? No. Uh, the later writer will let... Yeah, so, yeah. Some, are in, some are in Pali and some are in Sanskrit. Uh, sometimes they are... Uh, uh, yeah, it's usually considered that the ones in Sanskrit are later. I think the Buddhas would say that the earlier ones were revealed but were kept hidden and then came out later on. Or also in Buddhist uh, Mahayana thought there's a provision for further revelation because uh, the Buddha, according to Mahayana philosophy, has three forms or three bodies. Hmm? There's called uh, there's we might as well get into it. Can I erase this now? Yeah. Links me to uh, Govinda Vasya. I've seen a sutra which, which mentioning Saguna Brahman. It seems that it's the term, at least, he got it from uh, the sutras. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Anyway, I, we can talk about it later. I can't get into it now. You have to show me the sutra. Uh, anyway. We were talking about the development of uh, Buddhism and the way Buddhist uh, ideas go. Um, there's different schools of Buddhism. It's split into two branches, maybe about 400, 500 years after Buddha, although the, the beginnings of the split were very early on. Uh, into these two groups called the, the, the Mahayana Buddhism, which means greater vehicle, 
uh, and the Hinayana Buddhism, H-I-N-A, Hinayana, lesser vehicle, also called Theravada uh, Buddhism. Theravada? Yeah, T-H-E-R-A. In Sanskrit, Stavirabhada, the doctrine of the elders. Uh, so, in the Hinayana or Theravada Buddhism, which is usually considered to be older, and most scholars think, for whatever it worse, that it represents, you know, the original understanding of Buddha, Buddha is regarded as an ordinary person who attained enlightenment and instructed everybody else to do the same thing and become Buddhas themselves. It was a group of monks uh, locked away from the world, performing s extraordinarily severe uh, asceticisms uh, with the idea of, through certain forms of meditation, becoming and fully enlightened to become Buddha themselves. And the I ideal person was the uh, Arhat. Uh, that was the ideal the fully attained person was called an arhat, which of course is, I think the Jains use the same term. Uh, which you became, yeah. Some, sometimes in the writings it's referred to the Buddha. Yeah. Uh, or become Buddha. Yeah, that's right. What is, I mean, that's a... Well, because the Buddha, the Buddha is, is everyone is supposed to be able to attain nirvana and become a Buddha. Now, let me, I'll get, I'll get to that. So, so, anyway, for far as anyone can tell, with Theravada school, you know, it was very naturalistic. There wasn't any religion about it. Buddha was an ordinary person who attained Buddhahood, and we're all supposed to do the same thing. But early on, there was a group uh, split, uh, and another group uh, divided off. They're called the Mahasangikas, led by a monk named uh, Mahadev who labeled uh, criticisms against the Arhats, who said that they fell short of the Buddha in, in six, uh, five different ways. Uh, this is interesting, actually. Uh, typical, a lot of monkey's criticisms. He said that the Arhats, they were able to discharge semina at night, which showed that they were, they were uh, not free from the influence of demons. They weren't omniscient. They sometimes had doubts and they depended upon others for their liberation. Therefore, they fell short <laughs> of the attainment of the Buddha, right? And from this, from this Mahasangika's idea, you see the idea that the Buddha is, starts to get elevated out of people's, is considered to be out of people's range. That he's, you know, characteristic, that now to be a Buddha, you have to be omniscient. You know, this is one of the characteristics of the Buddha. So what happens in Mahayana Buddhism? is Buddha becomes uh, an object of worship. In the Theravada Buddha, he's not an object of worship. Buddha becomes an object of worship. This Mahadeva is the one that kind of originated the... Yeah, well, that, this is the record of this early, early criticism by one whose name has come down to us. You can just imagine the particular nasty sort of battle this one was, huh? Is this one Mahasangikas, that's what they were called, this group that, that split off, the Mahasangikas. means the great, greater assembly. They had, seemed to have more people. Yeah, that's just a little background, you know. <laughs> and then Mahayana. And then later, that, from that, uh, scholars say this Mahayana uh, showed up, uh, became, evolved later, uh, the greater vehicle. And in Mahayana, the ideal is not the Arhat, but the ideal is the bodhisattva. Uh, since the Buddhist idea is to totally become totally uh, uh, free from all conception of, of ego or of self, they say self, let's use their terms, to get completely obliterate and distinguish the idea of self, right? According to the, to the, the Mahayanas, in this arhat ideal, there was still selfishness because you were working for your own uh, nirvana. So the Buddha, bodhisattva is a person who works for the liberation, who puts off his own attainment of nirvanahood, 
uh, in order to uh, help others attain. And so bo the Bodhisattva takes birth, takes birth life after life after life after life after life uh, and, uh, and helps other people, postponing his own nirvana. So this becomes the ideal and the, this, this, uh, this Bodhisattva ideal. Also in the Mahayana you then get the idea that, this, that the historic Buddha that appeared, you know, for around 500 B.C., was a single incident. No, in Mahayana, there's past Buddhas, there's future Buddhas, there's Bodhisattvas, there's a whole, you know, everybody says they're influenced by Hinduism. This is what the scholars say, you know, because all of a sudden you get Buddhas everywhere, you know, like gods and my gods, and, you know, so on like this. Huh? They, they worship Buddha, but they also send other Buddhas Yeah, other, because you see, in the Mahayana, you get this notion that there's the, the body, the Buddha has three bodies, uh, this is a very interesting idea, and it'll show that in the Mahayana, that even though how there's worship, and people refer to it as a strain of bhakti, that this impersonal, uh, you know, comes higher. Three bodies of the Buddha are, first he has what's called the Dharmakaya, same word that we know, kaya means body or form, Dharmakaya which is the, you know, essence of all being, really. This is the highest, you know, form of Buddha, which is just, you know, the essence of everything. It's identified with the nirvana itself. Then he has this... It's not a person anymore. Person, we don't have person in Buddhism. Just remember that. <laughs> How do you have people taking verse over and over again? They're not people. They're just, they're just a, a, a certain stream of, of impulses that are united together. We'll get into that. Well, I just want to outline a little history, and then we'll sit down and try to understand the Buddhist uh, technique, which is the deconstruction of the self. So dharmakaya means... Uh, uh, yeah, the, it's, it refers to the essence of all being, but you could say, uh, you know, the... Uh, dharmakaya. <clears throat> yeah, the word dharma in, in, in uh, uh, Buddhist uh, terminology has lots of different meanings, but uh, uh, yeah, it's just the, the, the body that's the essence of all being, the, the you know, great impersonal, you know, netting, same idea, you know. To totally unmanifest, you know, beyond imagination, beyond speech. This is the Dharmakaya is is the there's only one Buddha, you know, and this is it, this Dharmakaya up there, you know, that's beyond all description. Then there's the you now you're down into the world of manifestation. But still Dharmakaya exists, though. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, it doesn't not exist, it doesn't you can't say it either exists and not exists, nor can you say it neither exists nor doesn't exist. Okay. It's one of the bodies of you. It's indescribable. It's referred to as it's referred to as the body of the Buddha. Yeah, with three three Buddhas. So the highest level is called the Dharmakaya, a form, the form of Dharma, which is really, you know, formless. Don't expect me. To tell you, it makes sense. Then the sambhogakaya is this is the, samboga means enjoyment body. This is the glorious divine forms, like we would have in the upper heavenly planets, maybe you know, like that. Not the Buddha you see on Earth, but the celestial Buddhas of which there. Are, you know, if you ever seen these uh, Buddha's paintings, you know, you see billions of them up there. Uh, this, this sambhogakaya enjoyment body, which is the source of uh, successive revelation. And then we have the uh, I can't read my oh, yeah. If later on there's more truth that comes down uh, new scriptures peer up, uh, show up that you can't trace back to the historical Buddha, they come, somebody's been, they talk to people, you know yeah, well, or else people, you know, people talk to them. They give revelations to various people. But there's celestial beings 
They're, they're celestial beings. Yeah, they're like demigods in, uh, in our scheme of things. Or even they would say they're like Krishna, you know, because they're manifest. Uh, but the highest one is totally unmanifest, unimaginable, unapproachable, cannot be described as either existing or not existing, you know, is out there. <laughs> And then near Manakaya, which is the descended form unto this plane, this earth, for delivering people. Uh, often this is described as a projected appearance of a human being, not really a human. You know. Here he seems to have a human body, he seems to undergo problems, he has to strive for nirvana. That's all, you know, not real. Okay. Anyway, this is they get this. So you see, like here, the, the, the this, this Dharma Kaya, this impersonal ideal. Let me see if I can find a little description of it for you from an authoritative scholar here of Buddhism. Uh, who must should have? the Dharma body is the Buddha as absolute. It is one and single, and the other two bodies emanate from it and supporting supported out of it. The enjoyment body is his manifestation to the bodhisattvas, and so on. This is bodhisattva um, Buddhism. Yeah, this, uh, this same thing with the Mahayana. They have this bodhisattva ideal. Bodhisattva means future Buddhas. They're not yet Buddhas. They're Buddhas to be who have put off their own Buddhahood for the sake of others. Dharmakaya and Sambhogakaya and Bodhisattva. Uh -huh. Bodhisattvas are, are Buddhas coming up. These are, these are three different manifestations of Buddha. Uh, uh, another being is the Bodhisattva, who's not yet a Buddha. He may be perfectly qualified to be a Buddha, but he stays on this lower plane in order to save people. A parallel is how we say there's a Uttama Adhikari but sometimes stays on the platform of Majjhima Adhikari just to preach. Is, that, is a Bodhisattva then would he be a Nirmana Kaya? No, no, he's not even a Buddha. This is the form of a Buddha. Bodhisattva is a, is a Buddha to be. Well, he'll become a Nirmana. When he becomes a Buddha, yeah, he may be, he'll, he'll, he'll then merge and become, you know, yeah, he'll merge into this and be manifested on these two planes too. Something like that, anyway. I'm not a Buddhist, you know. I mean, I can give you the names of books if you really want to find this stuff out. The point is just to get a general, crude idea. And if you know this general, crude ideal, you know more than most Buddhists, by the way. Is this a greater vehicle, lesser vehicle? What's that relationship? Hmm? What's the relationship between Hinayana and Mahayana, lesser and greater vehicle? What's that actually related to? Uh, well, I guess uh, Mahayana means it can save many, many people. Hinayana can only save a few. For he saves himself. Yeah, it's only good for the few, whereas Mahayana is good for everybody. By the way, the, the Hinayana, I should have written these words down. The Hinayana was strictly monks. Mahayana, the greater and greater influence of lay people who couldn't follow the strict monk orders, you know. So they have the bodhisattvas, they get mercy from the bodhisattvas. If they worship a bodhisattva, first they go to that bodhisattva's place, then they make further progress, you know, gradual elevation, because they can't... Uh... So in the Mahayana, greater... Uh... Okay, now I just, that's, just, that's just like a general outline. Now there are philosophical differences between these two schools, which we will touch on a little bit. Uh, but first I just want to go, next thing I want to do after outlining all that business is to go over these uh, Buddhist uh, scriptures here. Hmm? I just wanted to know, does, do, do any of what you've discovered, does that correlate with anything Prabhupada said about Buddha? I mean, one of these Buddhas, one of the Buddhas that you're describing here, what, the one that Prabhupada so far as I know, the Buddha we discuss is, you know, Prince Siddhartha of the Sakya family, the Gautama uh, tribe, who appeared in Behar. You know, which according to them would be the Nirmanakaya. When Lord Chaitanya met those Buddhists, and there's a long 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's uh, that, that must I try to track that down. All I can say is at the time Lord Chaitanya uh, met Buddhists, at that time Buddhism in India was in a tantric phase. We're not even going to discuss tantric <coughs> Buddhism. Because uh, there's three really big periods of Buddhism. First is the Hinayana, then the Mahayana, then the tantric. And tantric Buddhism is very big today uh, because it comes out of Tibet and all those Tibetan exiles, uh, Rinpoche and all these people are in America spreading Tantric Buddhism and a lot of it's the left-handed stuff so it has sex and so it's real attractive to everybody and huh no no you that is uh, that's a form of Japanese Buddhism related to Mahayana uh, it's, it's a form of Pure Land Buddhism but I mean because Buddhism this is just I'm talking about India then it goes into China in China, it becomes uh, the Chinese naturalistic mind boils it down to what's called Chan, you know. <coughs> Chan Buddhism, I think that's how you spell it. And then, which in Japan becomes Zen. Chan? Yeah. That's the way I've seen it. I don't know how you say it. That's the way I've seen it written. No, he's just the Buddha. This is all what Buddhists think. Prince Siddhartha is a Shaktivesh avatar Krishna come to delude the atheists, stop the animal slaughter and everything. That's the truth. But beyond all that, a whole religion started. So I'm describing this religion a little bit, what they think. Hinayana, they don't worship. Hinayana, they say, he's our ideal. He was the one who came to show us the way. We offer him respect, but he's not a god. Uh, he's someone who attained enlightenment. He's our teacher. We're also striving for our own enlightenment. They recognize those things today. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, 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 he's the one that told them everything. He, you know, the whole story, you know the story. I, I assume people know the story about how he appeared and he was a king. And it was a uh, prince that was prophesied that uh, you know, he would become a great renouncing religious leader. And his parents didn't like it. They wanted him to remain a prince, so they locked him up. You know the story? They locked him up, kept him away from all unpleasant sights and everything like that. He had a beautiful wife. Everything was sweet. And then one day, finally, he went outside and he saw a, an old person. First time he'd seen an old person. He's shocked. What is this? You know, one side blows his mind. What happened to that? Oh, it's just an old man, you know. <laughs> and then he goes out and he sees a person with disease, a leper or something. He's shocked. He's horrified. What is this? You know, it's just a leper. And then the third time he goes out, he sees a corpse. And that's it, you know. He renounces everything. He goes off. He understands the nature of material existence. There's no happiness in this world. And he goes off looking for the truth. And he finds, he comes in with ascetics. Uh, he performs rigorous austerities and penances. He almost loses his life. He becomes so thin. That's not the way. Uh, finally, he sits under this bow tree. And he meditates and he meditates. And he achieves enlightenment, nirvana. And he comes out and he speaks the sermon in the deer park in Benares, his first sermon, and Buddhism is born. That's the story, something like that, right? That's what we're talking about when we talk about Buddha. After that, all kinds of things happen, you know. Okay, so let's look at this, uh, these selections from Buddhism here. I just want to get down the basic ideas <laughs> of uh, Buddhist philosophy, uh, just so you can have a handle on them. Uh, and you can understand what they're trying to do. So in the first one, these are, these are Hinayana uh, scripture, but on the other hand, they're common basic beliefs that everybody holds in the, in the Buddhists. Uh, so the first one, then the three characteristics, first characteristic is Anitya. That's the Sanskrit name. Anitya, impermanence. No nitya, huh? You have to look on with some of you have a little copy? 
I'm getting a few more made up. Yeah, well, it's right here, this first one, right? And then you have an extra? Let you look up. He says, whether Buddhas arise or whether Buddhas do not arise, it remains a fact in the fixed and necessary constitution of being that all its constituents are transitory. Anitya. Everything is impermanent. Now we'll see what happens. This becomes a metaphysical principle. Not just we think that everything's a temporary but that impermanence is the essential nature of things, that they have no essential nature. And so in Buddhist thinking, uh, which is also in the Hinayana and Manayama, the ultimate constituents of reality are little unit events. You know? The, Buddha, the Buddhist word for the ultimate constituents of reality, just like you know, in physics, that things are ultimately made of, say, atoms, you know? So what is the basic, you know, unit of reality of which we, or of the world is made out of? We won't call it reality. The Buddhas use this word, dharmas. They're called dharmas. And each dharma is a unit event. It's a momentary happening. It's a process. It's a uh, temporally atomic. You see? So in the basic idea, it is not that there are substances or things which undergo changes. There are just changes which if they're real slow we call them things. You see, so they ultimately have this very uh, process view of reality. Uh, that there's no nitya, there's no soul or no substance to anything. We're all just a flow of these little, you know, explosions of events which come and go bang, 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 bang. And because there's similarity in the sequence, we abstract from them and say, well, that's a thing. So that's anitya. And first of all, there's this temporary thing. Then second of the characteristics of reality, he says, that all its constituents are misery. All the constituents of being are misery, dukkha, because of being temporary, they're all miserable. And the third one, that all its being elements are lacking in an ego, that is to say a substantial permanent self-nature, anatma. Oh man, I had nightmares all last night when I could sleep. I was reading Buddhist literature all day yesterday, which is the wrong thing to do on a codice. And uh, I fell asleep last night, and all I dreamt was like this god awful roaring void with these little atoms coming in and out and in and out and in and out. I tell you, it was freaky. I'm, I, mean, I really had a very, very bad time. It was just nightmarish. <coughs> You may notice, however, the similarity between this view and that promulgated by modern physics. And why these guys are really delighted, because basically this is what they come down to. You know, there aren't things, they're just fluxes. They're just, you know, disturbances in a, in a quantum field. And that's all that everything is. <laughs> Okay, he says right here, all its elements are lacking in an ego. There's no substantial, permanent self-nature. <laughs> Things don't have an essence. In other words, and what they get, what they, they, they get their definition from the relationships they happen to be in at the time. In themselves, they're another. This is like existential philosophy, if you know, existentialism. <laughs> Existence precedes essence. Uh, 
that things derive their nature from everything else they're associated with, but in themselves they lack any nature of their own. They're the little moment events and they're in a pattern of relationships and that pattern of relationships, of ever-dissolving, ever-changing relationships, determines what it is. Uh, misery, dukkha, dukkha. It's same word we have, dukkha, anudoshanam. Huh? Huh? Uh huh? Now you see, in one sense, you know, this is all, you know, the d- devotees who read this say, yeah, sure, you know, I understand this. It's our philosophy too. But look what they do with it. You see, look where it gets taken. <laughs> because all of this is what you have. You see, this is not based on Vedic teachings. Nowhere in here does Buddha cite the authority of the Vedas. He, he, he does not use... That's why, you know, the Buddhist thing is called uh, Nastika. You know these two words, Astika, Nastika? Huh? Remember one of the quality, qualities of a Brahmin? Astikyam? Uh, Astikya, I mean, isn't that right, Astikyam? Yeah. It comes from the word Asti. Asti means it is. And what is? The Vedas. Really it means that you accept the authority of the Vedas. And so that's why when we get the, you know, the, 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 the six darshans, sad darshans, uh, what distinguishes them from Buddha is all six darshans accept the authority of the Vedas. Even the atheistic Sankhya is considered astika, astikya, because it accepts the authority of the Vedas. You know, so uh, Gautama's Nyaya, uh, Kanada's Vaisheshika, they all accept the authority of the Vedas. But Buddha, Buddhism, Jainism, Nastikya, they don't accept the authority of the Vedas. Na Asti is not. How do you spell the four words? Hmm? How's the four words? What's the spell? Uh, who don't accept the authority of it. Well, that's two that are in India right there. You know, old ones. Jain, Buddhism, Zoroasters, the Zoroasters. Uh, we have Parsis, Parsis, yeah, they're Parsis. Yeah. Nastika. So, Astika. So, there's no acceptance of authority of the Vedas. Who was it came up and asked me the other day about the Dharmapada? Was it you? Yeah, I made a mistake. You're right, the Dharmapada is a polytext. I was mixing it up with the with something else, uh, the uh, Prajnaparnamita. I looked it up. I happen to have the Dharmapada. And the Brahmins are praised in there. But it also it explicitly states that a Brahmin is not someone who has taken birth from a Brahmin, a father or mother, but one who has these qualities. It, yeah, but it completely denies the hereditary uh, nature of the Brahmin. So the Brahmin is just, you know, a good Buddhist. Um, is that- Yeah, yeah, it is an oil. Um, okay, so that's the first. Then the first sermon. This is the sermon in the deer park huh? when he came out. And he explain, explains this uh, eightfold of uh, the uh, four noble truths. Now, this is a very basic Buddhist philosophy four noble truths. The first is the noble truth of pain. Birth is painful, old age is painful, sickness is painful, death is painful, sorrow, lamentation, dejection, and despair are painful. Contact with unpleasant things is painful. Not getting what one wishes is painful. In short, the five skandhas or khandhas of grasping are painful. Now, the skanda we'll get into a little later on, but that's the elements that make up what we erroneously call a person are these five uh, skandhas. Form, feeling, perception, impressions, and consciousness. Mm. We'll get into them a little later on. Huh? So the first of the four noble truths is material existence is suffering. Life is suffering, right? Everything is painful. By its essential nature, existence is suffering. We would say material existence. They just say existence. Huh? Second noble truth What is the cause of this suffering? Craving. 
the craving which leads to rebirth combined with pleasure and lust, finding pleasure here and there, the craving for passion, the craving for existence, and the craving for non-existence. Yeah. It's cravings. So, material life is suffering. The cause of suffering is our desires, our cravings. Third, how do the third noble truth involves the cessation of suffering, which is the extirpation of desire. Cessation without remainder of that crazy, craving. That's the extirpation of desire. And then the fourth noble truth is the way that leads to this extirpation. That is what he calls the Eightfold Noble Path. Right views, right intentions, right speech, right action. And that's what he's come to truth. And he says, he says, with this knowledge, he said, just these things alone, he says, I have attained the highest complete enlightenment. Thus I knew, knowledge arose in me, insight arose that the release of my mind is unshakable. This is my last existence. Now there is no rebirth. Huh? So that's very basic, the four noble truths. Material existence is suffering, the cause of suffering is desire, the cure is to become free from desire, desirelessness. I don't know. Pain is dukkha, craving is tana. I don't know about uh, uh, cessation, uh, what, what word is used here. Okay, now in the, in the next section, the synopsis of truth gives a little more, ex, ex, expands on these things about what is suffering, birth is suffering, decay is suffering, so on, on page 276 he starts, first, the noble truth of suffering, he elaborates on it. And it concludes that part with all the factors of the fivefold grip on existence which are suffering. They are the factor of form, feeling, perception, impressions, and consciousness. These are the five skandhas, S-K-H-A-N-D-A, -A -A, that's in Sanskrit, which make up a human being. Uh, form, rupa, you know. Uh, matter. I can give them to you in Sanskrit. I wrote them down somewhere. You have form, which is matter. Then feeling, right? In Sanskrit, Vedana, V-E-D-A-N-A, -A, long A, Vedana, feeling. That is pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And then perceptions, that is sense perceptions which are called in Sanskrit samjna, S-A-M-J-N-A, samjna, samjna, I don't know, with a long A. Remember, these are Buddhist technical terms. These same Sanskrit words used in Vedanta may have a completely different meaning. You have to remember that about Sanskrit. Everybody's got their own technical terms. They use common words, you know. Then impulses, Greed, hate, faith, wisdom, dispositions, you know, you know, activities of the will. Sanskrit are called samskara, S-A-M-S-K-A-R-A, -S -S -A -A, same word we use, samskara. And then the last one is consciousness, is vijnana. They use the word vijnana for consciousness. Huh? And according to the Buddhist analysis, these are what constitute a human being. Out of the interaction of these four arises the fiction that there's a self. You see, there's no self in any of these as far as they're concerned. These are just the five different kinds of events that go on that we identify with and call a self. And they persist in time because of desire. When desire comes to an end, it breaks up and you achieve nirvana. 
right? So these things, these are the skandhas. Who's the desire? Hmm? Who's the desire? No, desire just arises. Desire creates the desirer. <laughs> it's not that first I'm a subject and I desire, or rather they're desires, and when they come together they make a desirer. <laughs> huh? It is there, you know. But as far as they're concerned, this is not a theory about, you know, to explain the existence of the world. This is the way it is. This is all therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah, when, when desire goes, these gandhas, they break up, they dissolve, they cease and you blow out into nirvana. Nirvana means really, you know, extinguishing or blowing out. Anyway, yeah. Because of attachment to these things, because of thinking these things constitute a permanent self, when actually there is no permanent self. And so when there's change, there's disease, when things go on, then there's suffering. <laughs> In other words, it's the same psychological thing. The thing we talk about false ego. The identification of the self with the material body and the material mind. But you just, you know, that's a fictional self. But in, in, in the Buddhist idea, that's the self. And the real, you know, self means these things. So when, when uh, they're dissolved, there is no self. Anyway, so that's, that's the, everything is suffering. They all cause suffering. The origin of the suffering, it is any craving that makes for rebirth and is tied up with passion's delight and cold satisfaction now, here, now, there. So he outlines the, the, the craving. What's the noble truth of the cessation? The end of the craving. And then this eightfold noble path. So then he outlines this path First thing is right outlook, that is to understand this, what's just been taught. Then page uh, 277, then right re resolution to renounce the world and to do no harm to any creature. Then right speech, these are some moral rules. Right acts, you don't take life, you don't steal, you don't engage in lust. Then right livelihood. Right endeavor, that is to, right endeavor means to be determined to attain nirvana. Right mindfulness, realizing what the body is, what feelings are, what the heart is, and what the mental state are. Here we get into actual Buddhistic processes of meditation, and which, which amounts to, as I said earlier, is the deconstruction of the self. In your process of meditation, you gradually deconstruct the idea of the self. You detach yourself, you analyze yourself in terms of these skandhas, you see they're going on, you become detached to them. You see, that's what you do. And then right, what they call rapture here, is uh, the levels of ecstasy which develop and so on when this is achieved. Right, so that's the Eightfold Noble Truth, uh, the Fourfold Noble Truth, Eightfold Noble Path. Next thing is very, very prominent standard Buddhist thing of dependent origination. In Sanskrit, this is called... <coughs> All these, by the way, have their counter terms in Pali, which uh, I'm not giving you. This is dependent origination, which is also called the middle doctrine, which avoids the extremes between being and non-being, according to Buddha here. So it starts with ignorance. Now, according to Buddhas, you can start anywhere. This is like a cycle that entraps we would say entraps the spirit, soul, and birth and death. They can't use that language. 
But that's what it amounts to. Huh? What is this stuff? Do, do you see where it says dependent origination? Page 278. This is the Sanskrit term, just for your information. Pratitya Samutpada. Pratitya Samutpada. It's also called a dependent co production uh, and so on. This is a very central, you know, the, well, what's made out of this is amazing. So he says, on ignorance, avidya depends karma. On karma, karma depends consciousness, vijnana. On consciousness depends name and form, nama and rupa. On name and form depend the six organs of sense, that includes the mind. On the six organs of sense depend contact, that is to say with sense objects. On contact depends sensation. On sensation there arises desire. On de de desire comes attachment. On attachment depends existence. We would say material existence, but as far as they're concerned, it's just existence. And on existence depends birth. And on birth depends old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, misery, grief, and despair. Thus does the entire aggregation of misery arise. But on the complete fading out and cessation of ignorance, wrong knowledge, uh, karma ceases. When karma ceases, consciousness ceases. Consciousness ceases, name and form disappear. Name and form disappear, then the organs of sense vanish. The sense organ of sense vanish. There's no contact, no contact, no sensation, no cessation, no desire. No desire, no attachment, no attachment, no existence, no existence, no birth, etc., etc., etc. Right? Well, that all kind of makes sense in its own way. It's just about, you know, becoming, uh, identifying yourself with the material body and what happens. Huh? Well, that's where he gets it from. Oh, this is where he gets his stuff. Most of Scientology is uh, uh, covered Buddhism. <laughs> yeah, most of its, most, the core stuff is Buddhist stuff. Well, Buddhism overlaid with science fiction. Yeah. Uh huh. How do people latch on to this? Latch on to this? How do they make sense of it? How do they incorporate it in their well, they want to become free from birth, death, old age, and disease, you know. And uh, so they understand that, that, that uh, this is being caused by their attachments. And they want to extirpate their desires. And so then, then what they do is they enter into practices of meditation, which involve becoming detached from the various interior products of the mind. And which you see yourself, uh, you disassemble. You know, you disassemble your empirical existence through meditation and gradually becoming detached from it. You become detached from your thoughts. You become detached from your desires. This is the idea. It's very, very rigorous. And it's, 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 it's the business, since we almost have to stop now, let me just give you a little prospectus about defeating this sort of philosophy. And in one sense, it can't be defeated because it's not there to defeat. Uh, it's a therapeutic. In some ways, it's not a view of the world. I mean, you can get into philosophical technicalities of this you know, process metaphysics that's outlined here. But actually, a really good, uh, uh, at least uh, Mahayana's Buddhist, denies the reality of all views. As we'll see later on, in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, there's a criticism of all views. The concept of causality itself is destroyed. You know? Uh, so, and contradiction is enshrined. As in once you have any idea at all that's a specific concrete idea about things, if you subject it to criticism, you'll see that it's self-contradictory. But anyway, it's hard to get a hold on Buddhism. And anyway, nobody, no Buddhist I ever met understands this stuff. You know, I mean, real guy said he was a Buddhist, you know. 
Uh, I know academics that understand this stuff, but they're not Buddhists either. They just study it. Uh, and uh, But the thing is that, at least like, see, when I first came to a temple, I had been, I decided that Buddha said something that was essential, that this you know, material existence is suffering. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I could understand that. That the cause of the suffering is our desires. I knew that too. And that we had to become free from desires, I agreed. But at that point, you know, there was a practical failure. And this is what you'll find out in most people you meet who even claim to be Buddhists. They are not anywhere near to extirpating desires. They just can't do it. Because the Buddhists that even, you know, made a big stab at it, they were so rigorous and so austere, you would die doing what they do. And they... And you do this simply through strength of mind alone. You know, by rigorous, rigorous, rigorous asceticism and mental concentration. You were telling me you saw this a film of uh, Buddha sitting in meditation. You know, they'll sit and just stare at a wall for 12 hours at a time without moving a limb. And when they fall asleep, there's a guy who goes along with a stick and goes, Tawak! And that's what you do. There's very, very few people that try that. And even then, it's extremely hard. And we say it can't be done. That desires cannot be extirpated. That desire is a national, natural condition of the soul. And the point is to purify desires. Again, you see, you have this Buddhist, they're, they're empiricists. Desire means material desire. And so you have to become free from desire. But desirelessness, we say, is impossible. And it's on the practical failure that people like myself became devotees, that it at least seemed possible that if you chanted Hare Krishna, something might happen <laughs> that wasn't happening any other way. And you'll similarly see, and this is a big thing with Buddhists or any other Mayavadis, is that at least you see with Shankaracharya and Buddhas, altogether there's this radical renunciation of the world which all these people who are Mayavadis, but they simultaneously believe the world is unreal, that it doesn't truly exist, the whole thing is a fiction, and they're trying to enjoy it, which is really perverse. That's how you end up with fascists and things like that, you know, that you just create your own reality. You know, all truth is a myth, and I make my own reality, and so on. Yeah. You know what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, 17th, 16th chapter, why nature? Yeah. Yeah, they create this idea. Asatyam, is that what he says? Asatyam, apratishtam, this is, you know, it's right there. Anishvaram. Mm -hmm. What amazes me is that out of all the books I've met, which is quite a few over the years, I haven't met one that's a strict vegetarian. Yeah, that's another thing that's happened. And that's, you know, that's why Blue came. Yeah, there's another thing that's happened. You don't see that many that are vegetarians anymore. Oh, they, just, they just accept whatever they give them. Right? So well, that's where they start out. The monks were supposed to be strict vegetarians. On the other hand, they weren't supposed to be attached and whatever was put into their begging bowl, they had to eat. So if meat was put into the begging bowl, they ate it because you couldn't be adverse either. Big controversy about this and it was settled by one great monk when a leper's finger dropped into his begging bowl and he ate it. Because the idea wasn't to enjoy, you know. Because they were saying, if we get meat, can we eat it? And he, so he's like, ate the finger of a leper. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain why the practices of the, the Zen current uh, drop a lot of the uh, devotional external aspects and come to life very close to the Vinayan practice, which are much more strict and Yeah, strict. yeah. I'll talk to you about. Uh, we don't have time to get into the 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 the, the Zen comes goes through after it goes. This Mahayana Buddhism goes into China, and then it undergoes a very Chinese are very practical, naturalistic, down to earth people. You know, almost anybody, any group of people I know. You know, so it seems what happened is you know Buddhism gets stripped down to its very naturalistic elements as much as possible, simplified. Although it has this Mahayana, the deconstruction of thought, 
I mean, that's what Mahayana Buddhism is about. Uh, this uh, this uh, uh, Madhyamika Buddhism. The, Ma, the Mahayana school is called Madhyamika in Sanskrit. And their big philosophy is Nagarjuna. And that's what he does, is the systematic deconstruction of thought. And the Zen Buddhism is like that too. But instead of having a whole you know, program for it, you just meditate on one koan that blows your mind. You know. My favorite one is, 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 is the master who holds up his stick and he says, if you call this a short staff, you oppose its reality. If you don't call it a short staff, you deny the fact. Now, say what it is, quickly. <laughs> and then when, you, you know, you, when you, your mind is completely blown, we have to attend to it, but at the same time, you can't use your, all your concepts and ideas, then you achieve Satori. Tell me the truth. It is not speech. It is not silence. Say what it is. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you know. A lot of people used to understand these things on a nice dose of LSD. Right? <laughs> is that what you're talking about? <laughs> we have to stop now. Our time is up. Yes? Uh, let me talk about that tomorrow. Okay? Uh, we don't have any more reading. You can just review what we have for tonight, or you can start reading those other essays that I've given you for the last part. And tomorrow I should have more stuff to hand out to you. And I'll try to finish this up on Buddhism and uh, discuss the examination. What does he say? If you call this a short stick... You're... If you call this a short stick, you oppose its reality. Right? Because you got this idea of a name, a stick. I mean, there's something that's there that, you know, more than just your, 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 you know, your categories, right? If you don't call it a short stick, you deny the fact. Now, say what it is quickly. All the